Thank you so much. It's it's really, really great to be here. I'm excited to be your first speaker in this series. Um, I'm also uh, excited that you will be my first audience trying out some new stories. Um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about this topic of scale, um, like, and, and I'll get into it a lot more and and i i've been wanting to sort of like open it up and, and actually yesterday like last night i was on a panel um with a bunch of like chemical engineers and vcs and folks who are thinking a lot about scale and like really kind of asking these questions like ah, like what are the technological challenges and my yeah, like as you're saying, right, like my my role at Ginkgo, like my interest, like my path has sort of taken me to understand that like often the hardest challenges when it comes to technology, the environment, solving some of these wicked problems are not technical, um, but are in fact at this interface between like technology, society, politics, all of these other kind of messy, messy things. And so Anyway, all to say, I kind of rewrote the talk like last night and this morning. And so it's a little bit like some new ideas, like new things to think through. I'd love for this to be a conversation. I'd love to have your feedback and input and to like really think about this together. Um, and if you're interested also in this interface between technology and society, uh, I'm also giving the STS seminar next month on February 17th. So uh, that's like part two uh, of this <laughs> kind of presentation, uh, more about like the how we sort of explore those things and, and the kinds of things I do in my job. I go. Um, but this is kind of like giving the, the sort of theoretical sort of framing of how to think about scale and biology. Um, okay, so one thing about me uh, is that I'm a huge nerd for bi biochemistry. Um, and so uh, after a sort of brief uh, flirtation uh, at age 10 uh, about the sort of scale and wonder of the cosmos and thinking I was going to be an astronomer, uh, I learned about the Krebs cycle when I was 11 and I became like completely obsessed, right? Like the, the idea that you had this like little like interlocking puzzle of these molecules, like flipping back and forth and making these cycles was just like so interesting and fun to like my weird little brain. Uh, and I think I think uh, what really got me um, was this, this uh, I think the, the way to describe it, um, have you heard of this word sonder? Like it's this recognition that everybody else has their own like experiences in their head <laughs> and like that, that like you just become like overwhelmed by the scale of imagining like you're, you have your own sort of perspective as the main character in your universe, but everyone else has their own perspective. Like, and you just like think about that times 8 billion and you get totally overwhelmed and that, that feeling, you know that feeling? Um, so the, now think about that, like all of us, the 8 billion of us, we have trillions of cells inside each of those trillions of cells are like zillions of little enzymes that are doing this action all of the time, like turning your pizza into you uh, and into the things that you do um, and into these kinds of like connections and interactions and like the societies that we have built. Um, and this like this interlocking and like totally overwhelming uh, sense of scale between these like microscopic, like atomic scale interactions of like how these molecules move and connect and inter and interact with each other um, and like how that turns into us. Uh, like, anyway, it blew my mind, my little baby mind. Uh, and like, I was like, I'm gonna become a biologist. Like, I didn't know what that meant. I thought I was maybe gonna be a doctor because that's what you do when you like biology and you're a little kid. Um, but I learned that, you know, over time that I could just become a scientist. I could spend all my time like learning about this stuff. I could be a biochemist. Um, and it wasn't until graduate school that I sort of like flipped one notch further, like that I couldn't, I could spend time learning about this, but I could also like design with this kind of a, a tool, a mentality, with this kind of like connection between scales of like what happens at this atomic level, um, what happens at this kind of like the way that we build stuff in the in the world um like and and that sort of connection to the environment things that grow the kind of the things that biology can do really well and so um i became a synthetic biologist um and synthetic biology is a really interesting field uh because it's 
itself like this kind of interesting ecology and ecosystem, right? Bringing together people from a lot of different disciplines who are all like equally nerds for biochemistry, um, but also like want to do something like are, are also engineers, right? So a lot of the people who started synthetic biology were kind of part of that early group of people trying to figure out what does it look like for us to design with biology? What might it look like if we could program DNA? Like they are computer scientists. Um, so like I'm a nerd for biochemistry. I don't know that much about computers, um, but I've learned a lot because I hang out with a lot of computer scientists. So I've learned that this is what it looks like when you use a microscope to look inside of the computer chips in, in our computers. Um, and so there's this incredible like nanotechnology that people need to do now to keep squeezing small, more and more and more transistors onto these computer chips that power everything in our sort of technical society. Um, and so the, the distance between these gates, which has something to do with like how the transistor flips from zero to one, that again, like I'm not a computer scientist. Um, so forgive me if you are, you can come tell me, explain to me how it works. Um, but that distance is 40 nanometers and, and people are kind of pushing the, the, the boundaries of nanotechnology and semiconductor fabrication uh, to keep shrinking that distance and keep being able to put more and more transistors onto a chip. Um, but you know, effectively there's like a physical limit to how many atoms <laughs> you can squeeze and, and, and put things together on the chip, right? Um, but so 40 nanometers is like this distance and like that's as good as we can do like, okay, right? Okay, so I'm gonna show you another thing in biology that's 40 nanometers across. Um, it's the flagellar motor um, that powers like, so, so little E. coli bacteria, um, they have little tails, uh, they spin around like this and they whiz around. Um, and that whole motor system like made up of like all of that really, really intricate like atomic scale, like nanotechnology, uh, that distance is the same as this, like our best nanotechnology. Um, and so, like, again, this like sense of like scale <laughs> and power of biology, like it starts to sort of overwhelm me <laughs> when I think about this, right? Because on the one hand, like this is NASA, like where they're building these kind of semiconductor fabrication. Uh, this is a public domain photo why I chose it, but like, you know, there, there's really, really, really incredible, like, you know, uh, infrastructure that needs to get built. Um, it's, there's, there's uh, if you follow politics, there was a CHIPS Act uh, sort of by the US government um, saying like, we should bring more of this kind of technology and infrastructure here in the United States. Um, we should like really be building a lot of technology, a lot of people, a lot of, of work to make those like distances. Um, and what biology does is very, very different because instead of like all of this work and all this infrastructure and all these tools and people and supply chains, like those flagellar motors happen inside poop, right? Like, I am, they are happening like with bacteria that grow themselves uh, and have evolved to have that kind of like incredibly intricate, like machinery um, that we couldn't, we just like cannot even possibly do um, with our kinds of nanotechnology as humans um, and human engineers. And so, um, yeah, I work with science engineers who say, well, uh, biology is nanotechnology that works. Um, if we want to be able to approach more and more atomic resolution be able to make things at that very small scale the way to do that is to be able to like work with biology um to partner with biology to be able to make things at those very small scales um then at the same time though like biology grows you make very very big scales too right like you have like all like forests right like everything on earth um that is biology all of that biomass um so you, you can also think about like the scale and scope of all of the materials and the stuff that we make today out of oil uh like and and how biology makes those things and start to reimagine those kinds of logics of, of technology and production and that's what synthetic biology is right like how do we do that how do we work with biology how what needs to be true in order for us to be able to do technology like this um, and to like reimagine our technological landscapes through this lens of biology, which does it in a way that is regenerative, like totally sustainable, totally circular, um, totally in a way that we just cannot do um, with the ways that our human technology today is built. So another like example that I want to kind of like really spend time on and dig into um, is, is how uh, nitrogen fixation works in biology versus in chemistry um, and industry. So in, in industrial chemistry, uh, there's like, again, like the same, like lots and lots of infrastructure, really, really big factories, like lots of machines and lots of, of uh, like 
tons and tons and tons of energy. So uh, put, get put into uh, like breaking apart nitrogen in like inert nitrogen gas from the air um, and adding hydrogen molecules to make uh, nitrogen, uh, which is then used as fertilizer in, um, for plants. And so this process has to happen at extremely high temperatures, uh, very high pressures in order to be able to break apart that kind of uh, those molecules and to remake them. Uh, I think the numbers are anywhere between like three to 5% of global uh, natural gas uh, use uh, is, is towards, <laughs> goes towards making ammonia in this way. Um, and, and it's like three to 5% of, of also like global greenhouse gas emissions comes from this process and from the um, sort of downstream greenhouse gases that come from the um, uh, sort of breakdown of ammonia in the soil into other kinds of greenhouse gases like nitric oxide. Um, and so that's how we do it. Um, and, and this process like like, I, you know, it sounds bad, but it also has made it possible for 3 billion of us to be alive today, um, because that without that kind of fertilizer, uh, like we can't grow as much food as we need for the people who live on Earth. Um, and so it's a it's a very, very, again, like one of these like wicked problems in, in, in the environment and how we want to think about, like, how do we feed ourselves? How do we grow? How can we how might we start to reimagine these processes and, and think about how to sustain um, and grow and re have a more regenerative relationship to, to, to the world. Okay, so how does biology do nitrogen fixation? So there's a few species of bacteria um, that can fix nitrogen. They can do that chemical reaction of uh, breaking apart nitrogen and adding hydrogens. Um, they do it with enzymes that work at ambient pressures and temperatures um, using energy that they get uh, by, by sort of either their photosynthesis, they're actually photosynthetic bacteria that can do this, um, or from carbon that they get from plants that they live in symbiosis with. Um, so inside of these little like nuggets, um, these nodules on the roots of this plant, um, there's a, like that's a little like nest to hold the bacteria that the, the, that nodule is made by the plant to protect the bacteria, um, to protect it from oxygen and to give it carbon, uh, to give it sugar that it's making from photosynthesis. And in exchange, the bacteria give the plant nitrogen. And so this happens in, in legumes like soybeans and peanuts and, and other kinds of beans, um, alfalfa, a, a small number of, of sort of legume crops, um, but not in other kinds of crops that are, are staples in our diet, like wheat and rice and corn. And so, um, but this is the way that biology does it. So not in, in large concentrated factories, but like, totally distributed uh, in, in the root when the plant needs it at the right time. Uh, it's a very, very different looking process. It's something that we cannot do today um, with our technologies. Um, but it's kind of it's kind of one of these like holy grail moonshot projects um, that biologists and bioengineers have been trying to do for like I think a hundred years at this point. Like, could we engineer uh, relationships like similar symbiotic relationships between these bacteria that can fix nitrogen in the soil um, and the crops that we eat at, uh, as as staples? So you know, there's there are systems that people have developed in across the world and where where you also have crop rotation to be able to sort of approach this, um, but then a lot of people are trying to see like what might it look like if we could start could we find species of bacteria that are really good at, uh, at hanging out with corn um, but can also fix nitrogen or could be engineered with those same nitrogen fixation genes um, and uh, from from other bacteria so that they could provide the nitrogen on the plant and so this is a very 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 difficult technical challenge a very difficult like uh, yeah uh that at that sort of molecule scale problem because these enzymes are really difficult. They're difficult to work with, they're complex. There's a lot of stuff going on with them. Um, there's a lot of research and a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, but it's an interesting sort of approach to sort of say like, could it, could it be possible? What would it look like? Um, it's something that Ginkgo is working on um, with Bayer. Uh, Bayer is obviously the, a very, very large agriculture and life sciences company. Um, and, and we're partnering with them to sort of try to develop this kind of technology. Um, where do I go in here? Oh, okay. So this is something that I, so yesterday uh, at this conference that I was at that has, has changed some of my thinking or that I made me rethink some of my slides. Um, this question came up like specifically about nitrogen fixation and our ability to, to, to use uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria in agricultural contexts. Um, and, I, and I had this slide already though, because this is the question that comes up 
constantly and like why I'm thinking about scale with respect to synthetic biology. Um, because you say like, oh, look, we can like engineer these yeasts and they can make this molecule and like, isn't that great? Like, and we can make it like this. And then and then the, the Debbie Downers and the like chemical engineers are like, well, does it scale? <laughs> and uh, they're asking because like in chemical engineering and in that world of those like power plants and the nitrogen factories, like that sort of the economies of scale that you get by concentrating that kind of technology and building really, really, really huge facilities to do this kind of chemistry is essential um, to like making the technology work. And so like that sense of scale is really important. And, 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 um, and, and so they're asking like, can biology compete at the game that like that oil basically has like set up for us um, where where they have these really, really gigantic installations. They have very, very low costs as a result. And I'll get into that more um, like can biology compete today like at that cost? The answer is no, like it's not true. It's not possible now. There's a lot of investment, a lot of work that will have to be done. And I think a new imagination about the way that we do technology that needs to be done too. Um, so but does it scale? Constant refrain. People also like make so the, people also use this a lot as a criticism of ginkgo. Like, oh, ginkgo, like you're spending all your time doing all this genetic engineering, like, but you don't know how to do scale. And like, that's also sort of missing the point of like what I think, again, like what a holistic approach to synthetic biology needs. We do do scale up, we do invest in that kind of technology and what it's going to look like to commercialize these products. Um, but I think we also have to recognize like there's a new kind, there's there's new ways that have, you have to think about these kinds of technologies as well. Um, you can't just look only at the price of things that are made with. Um, sort of industrial chemistry today and, and compare those one to one. All right, but the, so why, why do people say this now about nitrogen fixation? Well, so there's something also very interesting about biology, um, which is that soil is different in different places. Like plants are different in different places. Um, you have like different kinds of relationships you have uh, between the plants and the soil in different places. You have different climates that are gonna, the bacteria are gonna behave differently in those different places. Um, like, will it all work? Like, so you have this like new kinds of like so many variables that are introduced. And so it cannot be the same in every place, which is sort of a prerequisite to this question of scale. Um, you have to be able to like remove that context of the local environment to make something scalable um, in that industrial logic of, of uh, industrial chemistry. Um, so that was like one, that's one fragment of the question. The other piece is like, yeah, like, can you make enough nitrogen? Um, can you grow these bacteria and, and get them to the plant, to the growers, to the, to the soil at the right time, in the right place, in the right quantity? Um, will it be a, as effective um, as when, you know, you just spray fertilizer that all is the same everywhere around the world? And so that those I think are really interesting questions because again they open up the, this kind of question of like that sort of miraculous uh, sort of diversity and like dizzying level of scale that sonder of biology like all of these like unique relationships and circumstances that make biology so like thrilling and and like the opportunity that is there um, also is what is is seen as this kind of limiting factor to what biology could do in in the long term. So I'm Next thing, does that sound good? You're with me so far? Okay. So, um, uh, oh, so then like when you kind of think about those questions of like, okay, well, how does like, how does nitrogen fixation scale with a kind of chemical industry knowledge like versus how might it look in, in biology, right? So that's the kind of chemical process from the Wikipedia page about the Haber-Bosch process about how you like sort of are cracking the nitrogen and the, the natural gas and you're putting it all together and you're heating it up. Um, and again, like this is, it's the same everywhere. You could build a facility. Um, uh, you have again, a centralized facility that needs to have economies of scale um, to be able to do like put enough energy into it to make the cost low enough um, though you have to ship natural gas to those facilities like from the few places on earth where you make those things um, and you have to like yeah get all that that energy and the heat and the time and the pressure in the one in one place um, biology does the process like this like again like I said it was a really complex like enzymatic pathway there's a lot of these different sort of fragments of the nitrogenous enzyme and a lot of chaperones that help it fold and like build build the parts of the enzyme that all have to happen in concert um, they have to happen also without any oxygen present uh, they have to have uh, like enough nitrogen to, to turn on uh, but not too much to turn you know, anyway so like there's a there's a lot of sort of dynamic things that are happening inside of each and every cell um, all of those bacteria that are living inside of the soil um, and, and I think importantly, again, like where, whereas this has to be concentrated, 
um, because it has to have that economies of scale, like in the factory, it can only happen in those few factories. Um, it has to be that create the same product um, that is then going to be again without context sort of moved moved to different parts of the world. Like this must happen again in a very like specific context in a very specific cell in a very specific environment um, and sort of be tuned to that particular environment. So it's it's hard to kind of like control in the same way um, that we can control this, these kind of industrial chemistries. Um, this is actually, I like, again, I was excited. I got to like dust off old research. This is work I did in my postdoc. Um, I spent a lot of time in a, in a nitrogen fixation lab as sort of microbial ecology lab, um, looking at species of bacteria that um, uh, had like these symbiotic relationships with, uh, with species of legumes. Um, and so what I spent my time doing was sort of like unraveling some of the uh, evolutionary uh, processes that also sort of built those relationships between particular plants and particular bacteria at particular places. Um, and like was able to sort of trace this like exchange of genes between different species of bacteria um, and an evolution of those things. So, so what this is showing, I think on the, um, I have like on the left side is the, let's see like those are species of bacteria oh so so the like the colorful ones are match the bacterial species um oh wait is that right yeah yeah and then i think this is uh and, and the right side or like the different gene anyway what i'm saying is like the the different genes like map onto like the actual like when the plants, the when the col uh, continents diverge from each other, um, like there's like speciation that happens between the plants that live on both sides, um, and there are species of bacteria that are very similar on both sides of this divide, um, but they they have relationships with the different plants that need different genes. So like the the genes that that like uh, that determine the relationship to the plants are sort of geographically uh, isolated. So the blue ones like are are the the nodulation genes and the red ones in, in Southern Africa versus Southern uh, South America. So like you have this kind of, yeah, speciation event and sort of like exchange of information. Again, the conclusion here is that like everything with biology is like context dependent and local, depending on the relationships between these bacteria and the plants and, and all of these things that are happening in the particular specific location. Um, but at the same time, like it does scale, right? Like this is like continent level, like there's plants all over who are that are growing and thriving because of these relationships that are happening. Um, and so like the, the particulars matter, but they also can scale out into these kind of bigger, bigger environments in this context dependent way. And so so this is like the meditation on scale part. So like, there's a lot of really interesting kinds of people who are theorizing about these questions of scale and nature and like, well, where, and where does this bring us, right? So um, this is a, from, uh, on growth and form. Uh, so somebody writing about the like growth of, of animals and sort of like developmental biology, how do forms in biology take shape um, uh, over hundred years ago. Um, and he wrote that the effect of scale depends not on a thing in itself, uh, but in relation to its whole environment or milieu, it is in conformity with the thing's place in nature, its field of action and reaction in the universe. And so again, like, so I think this is a really important, like that's biology scales, it can scale, but it can only scale like in this very context dependent way, like in relation to everything else that's around it. Um, so like you, you can't, uh, yeah, you, we can't as humans like grow without our society, without our people, without our microbes, um, without all of the things that, that make us sort of, uh, uh, make us human um, because it's it's all only in those relations that we can grow in and, and, and scale. Um, and that's true at the very, very small scale and the very, very big scale with biology. Um, then there's other, other theorists. So, so Anna Singh writes on non-scalability. Um, she's got a really interesting book on, on mushroom hunters. Um, and so that's sort of like non-scalable book work of, of mushroom hunting and how those that becomes sort of like translated into global supply chains of these kind of commodity foods. Um, and those sort of like moments of exchange between different kinds of scales and, and, and the kinds of work and relationships they're in. Um, and so this is a sort of early version of that work, uh, an essay on non-scalability. And she says, scalability is not an ordinary feature of nature. Making projects scalable takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, and I think that that's like 
that's part of, I think, the work of synthetic biology uh, that as I see it, um, like when, and when, and when these people ask, you know, but does it scale? Like, I, I think again, that has to, in by necessity, hide um, the kinds of complexity in biology in those moments of exchange between scales and the kind of work that it takes to make something like be scalable in the kind of the, the sort of systems that we have today in place. Um, and so, yeah, like, she she talks she she brings up also the sort of like the difference between this word growth um which is kind of biologically uh oriented versus scale which is like technologically oriented um we talk a lot in in industry and in technology and in, in uh in the economy about growth a growing economy um and she says and she sort of like pokes at that and says like well that's not like why did we make growth mean expansion and scalable expansion growth is something that biology like living things do again like in relation to their to their environment and to their the kinds of the milieu um what does it look like to grow instead of scale when we're talking about these kinds of approaches um another theorist so uh, ursula franklin is a was a historian of, of technology um and a sort of a philosopher of technology her book is terrific if you haven't read it i highly recommend this uh the real world of technology and she also sort of begins like with this kind of like contrast between growth and scale um, and the kinds of things that that sort of require growth mindsets and models for for developing so education uh uh like growing and raising children uh, a lot of things require really a growth approach versus a production approach that's like a uh, you know assembly line uh and so she and she contrasts like kind of assembly line production model scale um, to, to growth early on in this book, um, and, and it's sort of like is, is a theme that kind of comes up throughout as she kind of talks about what it looks like to scale technology, what it looks like to build technology in the real world. Um, and so she says, uh, production models are perceived and constructed without links into a larger context. This allows the use of a particular model in a variety of situations. At the same time, such an approach discounts and disregards all effects arising from the impact of production, the production activity on its surroundings. Such externalities are considered irrelevant to the activity itself and are therefore the business of somebody else. Um, so, okay, this is now where it gets, so like, let's bring it all together. This is where it gets juicy, right? So, okay, if, if in order to scale, you have to ignore context, you have to ignore downstream impacts, like those are external, those are somebody else's problem. Now we're talking about like what we've been talking about all along, these industrial models of like how we do technology, the problem that we're trying to solve in the first place, right? So, you know, okay, oh, this is the natural gas tanker. So like, uh, or I think I have two tankers in here. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the, so the oil tanker, uh, you know, you have to, you only can make oil and natural gas in particular places where they happen to be underground. Um, they have to get shipped in these very large things um, and, and sort of moved to other places um, where they get like the, the refining happens. Like, again, this has to happen at a very high scale in order for the to the economics to work out um and and at the end you get something that is ridiculously cheap um so you get plastic at like a dollar per pound um and that's like the, the the benchmark that people are asking biology to scale to like oh can you get a dollar a pound but it's not it's not pricing in all that carbon. It's not pricing in the pollution, the downstream impact. Um, you can't, it's, it's just not, it's not part of the, the scaled process um, that we have inherited here. Um, and so uh, if we ask like, what could biology do? <laughs> What's a different model? So like, how does it scale? Um, I think we have to start asking it, it, it a different question, right? So it's not, can you scale to be exactly the cost and scope and scale of, of chemistry, industrial chemistry, um, what we've had for the past 100, 200 years? Um, but like, what will it look like to scale in this biological way? Um, and so I, I love this line, all atoms are local. Um, so Drew Endy is a professor at Stanford. He's really an early, um, an early thinker in this field of synthetic biology, like really brought a lot of the community together. He's someone who like I look up to a lot. Um, there's this really great article about him uh, in the New York Times. Um, and it sort of highlights his like, yeah, he's 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 very like, he's very good on the sound bites. Um, and in this line, like all atoms are local, right? So again, you don't need to ship oil from the places where it is to the factory. Um, you have like carbon <laughs> everywhere. Uh, 
right? You, we have, you can pull it out of the air. That's what plants do. Uh, they, 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 sit, they are in the soil in their particular place. Um, they pull carbon out of the air, they grow, right? Now you have biomass that's local to a particular place. Um, could you use that? How do you convert that into other things? We can eat it, we can feed it to yeast, we can brew things, um, we can make other kinds of things. Um, and likewise, like the, the scale might look different. You don't have to grow things like at that enormous scale um, in synthetic biology necessarily to get the, the, the economies of scale that you need. What could it look like to start making things in a more distributed way? Um, so you're, we're not making, for example, vaccines for, against COVID only in the United States and then shipping them around the world. Um, could you build local manufacturing um, that's able to meet the needs of people locally? Um, whether those are, yeah, vaccines, other kinds of medicines, other kinds of products that are, that are necessary in those moments. And so I think that's the kind of thing that biology, the synthetic biology might open up, like if we can have that imagination um, and we can think, think about that sort of like full spectrum and full the scaling in, in different ways. Um, it doesn't exist like this yet, <laughs> um, but there's lots of these experiments, I think, towards this question of like local production, uh, local thinking about like local feedstocks, new ways of thinking of about approaching the, these kinds of questions to make the things locally as you need them. Um, so where does ginkgo fit into this? Or like what, uh, ginkgo has like a different kind of scale that we talk about all the time and we think about all the time. Um, and, and there's a little bit of this kind of like, yeah, interesting place where these two kinds of scale have to meet, right? So like uh, ginkgo scale looks like the scale to do many, many, many experiments at once. Um, so like we've got like lots of computational tools and big databases and libraries and AI that lets us like navigate biological design space. We have a lot of automation and, and tools to uh, study and test and like analyze and like look into cells at enormous scale. So like millions of experiments at once. Um, and then we have tools to do that sort of bridging between the lab scale, like in the Petri dish in the, in the 96 well plate into the sort of tanks that, you know, you could start to imagine people manufacturing things um, at, depending on what you're trying to make. Um, and so we, we think about like scaling and growing like our capabilities to be able to do more and more and more experiments so that you could have more and more and more possible like particular things, right? Like, okay, I need to like actually adjust this to fit this context. I need to change the reaction conditions to work over here. I need to make a new um, kind of feedstock that can, can work with C5 sugar instead of C6 sugar. Um, like all of those things, all of those kinds of particulars need to happen and need to be sort of designed and need to explore this kind of big biological space and require a different kind of scale at this sort of experimental level. Um, and that's where we have invested a lot of like our, our time and technology and, and, and our team into building. Um, I've been at Ginkgo for about eight years now. Um, like I joined the company when we were 20 people and we had like one machine <laughs> and like, and, and the sort of like idea of what it might look like if we could kind of like add to the, like build that scale of that capability and all the things that we could do. So yeah, back then we had like two customers and like one wanted to make like a, a nutrition ingredient and one wanted to make a fragrance ingredient. And now we have like hundreds of people who have like lots of different kind of particular things in different kind of places. Um, and they can all use use that same kind of core technology because of that scale. Um, and then we can start to approach that sort of diversity of possibilities in biology. And so like th that to me is the dream. It's why I'm excited about Ginkgo. It's why I work in this field. It's why I've like I've kind of been part of this because I see that potential of like, could it be possible for some day? Oh, wait, oh, where do I go? Have oh yeah, like, could it be possible someday like to have like really local biomanufacturing? Um, like maybe not, yeah, I think people, there's like, uh, there's some like art projects people do of like, oh, like what if it was like in your house and you made your own insulin? I don't think it's making your own insulin, but like, I think at the like neighborhood level, like, right, like what would be like, you know, the CVS in, in Porter Square <laughs> like has a tank and it can make something, you know, like, and, and they see the prescriptions come in, they'll change the, you know, they're gonna change the, the they're gonna tune what they're making. Making, right or there's a kind of like a local biomanufacturing for different kinds of products and ingredients that you might are be looking for or needing um, and a sort of like a local economy that can be built and shaped around it um, what are the kinds of like you know who's making the you know who's the small scale like kind of artisanal producer of the strain um, like would they use ginkgo's tools or like would it be is are we so far in the future that that's actually like now all computer like you can type in like I want a cell that makes blah 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 <laughs> we can print it for you and send it to you
Um, yeah, like, are there students, right? Like making their own kinds of projects and, and building their own things again, like are accessing these kinds of tools and, and relationships and, and solving problems um, at their own scale at their own times. Um, oh, oh, this is, uh, yeah, what, what, what does the future look like in terms of, you know, like, what is beauty? What is like, what are the things that we have like that can, yeah, we, I've been talking about like meeting our needs of like basic, uh, yeah, like corn <laughs> um, and, and medicine and vaccines. Um, but how do we also sort of like ex have an explosion of creativity where we actually can use biology to make, make new kind of things just like because they're beautiful. Um, and so this is this was this was all AI generated imagery. I think I asked for like editorial uh, fashion photography of biodesigned garments, <laughs> um, and got this, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so I think that's actually all I have in terms of slides. Um, but I would love to like dream a little more together with you. Um, hear from you, like what are those kinds of problems that you are want to be solving? What are you thinking about? Um, how do we? Uh, uh, yeah, what do you think about uh, synthetic biology and what we could do together? I'm happy to bring the mic to you if you want to raise your hand. Everybody thinks of questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I'm still wrapping my head around some of the things you said. So forgive me if my question is not uh, uh, well formulated yet, but I guess I was thinking about this uh, in two ways. First, I'm very curious about more of the, the science behind it. I was curious yeah. about the, the types of crops you are uh, working on right now and yeah. um, how far along this is from becoming a reality to have uh, uh, engineer crops uh, or bacteria, I guess, uh -huh. that can partner with non legging crops. Yeah. And the second part of my thoughts were thinking about the scale and what I'm thinking about the type of partnerships that would be uh, necessary to make this local uh, bio uh, manufacturing uh, a reality, mm -hmm. but also, sorry, I have many questions no, back in one, so just, like just talk about whatever, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> and, uh, but I was also thinking about the access uh, of the technology and how Ginkgo is thinking about, mm -hmm. uh, about that aspect, yeah. who will get access to this and and how will this be accessible by uh, by farmers that cannot access to high cost inputs? Yeah. So some of those are some of my preliminary thoughts. <laughs> uh, so please feel free to comment on on any of those. So okay, I'll start with the like the science thing. So um, there's there's actually a handful of companies that are working on this kind of nitrogen fixation. Um, so there's there's other companies that are like already selling products that look like this. Um, uh, I think it allows you to like reduce the amount of uh, nitrogen that you're putting as as added fertilizer by like I think I've seen any numbers from anywhere from like ten to fifty percent. Um, sort of depending on the particular conditions, I think it's usually around corn um, is, is the sort of where people are starting. Um, so uh, I think the ginkgo projects are sort of similar. I've seen like, I think we're getting into sort of field trial scale um, experiments. Um, I think people are hoping, expecting, looking at like a, a sort of that lab scale. I think I've seen numbers like 40% improvement, like reduction in the amount of, of, of fertilizer that you need to do. Um, I think the way that it looks like technically is really interesting too, because again, like, um, a part of it again is like that that sort of scope and and scale and like possibilities of of all of the design space of biology. So you know, there's people who have has kind of collected samples of soil from farmland all over the world, and different kinds of relationships with different kind of plants. There's zillions of bacteria in there, um, and so the question becomes like, okay, how do I like look at that landscape of what's possible in evolution um, and try to sort of like understand that to map like the ones that are best at interacting with the plants and the ones that are best at fixing nitrogen and like what what is the things that need to get tuned um, like between those like how do you sort of like blend them together and so like there's different approaches that different people and labs and companies are taking um, to sort of do that that kind of work um, so that that's that piece of the question um, your second question was about like the bio manufacturing like what does it look like what needs to be start to be true Partnerships and access. So like, I think, I think when you, yeah, if you play out the tape, I think it looks a, a number of different ways, right? I think you need, uh, you need like capital at some, at some level, because you need like the 
tanks. It's like, so somebody's got to make the tanks. <laughs> um, and right now, um, you know, there's breweries, there's microbreweries growing, like they're all over the place, right? So that might, that's like kind of a little bit like the, the the trend sort of line you could start to see like okay what is what does it cost to build a brewery like okay you need a little bit of money you need a little bit of investment like there's probably going to be more investment because like you also if you're making like vaccines or insulin like there's now like a regulatory sort of quality level that's different than beer um but so you need to kind of do that kind of investment but like maybe that's a local government um can build that kind of level of of investment okay then you need like the workforce the people who are going to like do that the kind of work um so there's folks on my team who are building a lot of like workforce development kind of policy um curriculum um like thinking about sort of like what does it look like for folks um community colleges or technical schools like here locally to become Become operators of the machines as they exist today and start again like imagining what does it start to look like in the future where you have like fermentation engineers um, uh, who are kind of trained up to be able to do this kind of manufacturing. Um, then at the like, again the policy level, people are looking at like, okay, well, where do we have a lot of biomass and a lot of like fermentation capacity? Actually, in the Midwest, um, like that's where all the corn is. <laughs> like, um, like what, what does it start to look like? We have a bio belt um, where you have like again investment in, in kind of technology manufacturing onshoring kind of manufacturing in the US. And so there's there's a lot of efforts um, kind of in, in kind of federal government um, as well as sort of state governments are starting to think about that like, um, yeah, like local environments, like in core investments, workforce and education um, and sort of like bringing it all together. I think the other part of the puzzle, which maybe is not yet like as worked out as it should be is like, who, what are the products? Like who's making those things? Like are, are there sort of like small companies that can be like, uh, they rent out the tanks to make their product like they're going to be able like what does that sort of ecosystem or economy look like of, of these kinds of things and again you're start you start to see like glimmers of it so like I know one guy is like a friend on Twitter and he's like making his own flowers like and he's like trying to sell them on Etsy and like Etsy's shutting him down because they're like we don't want you to sell GMOs on Etsy and then he's like no man it's beautiful like wait like what, what does it look like or like where is it going to be like I've been working with designers on like okay I want to make uh garments that are you know uh dyed with bacteria but in a really small scale like who's you know like what's that kind of like could could you imagine like a more sort of flourishing economy of that creativity around if those if those kind of core technologies were there and so anyway that's that's the imagination in terms of access it's expensive now right so like I think yeah the projects that can go are not like you couldn't use your like student <laughs> stipends to pay for a project at Ginkgo like it's really it is something that you need like VC level money for a small company or like big company R&D budgets to approach but like that's why that's why we are sort of like so hung up on scale and economies of scale for experimenting and like could you drive those costs down like what are the things that they could become start to become accessible right now it's, it's I, I have to acknowledge it's not right like and but that's the the, the goal is to be able to, to get to that point um, and then and then are the products accessible that's another policy question I think right like how do you price your products how do you think about like customers like what's the economy of all of these things like that's that's another big question <laughs> i'd like to follow up sure. just really quickly on this when i think about nature inspiration around nitrogen fixation or phosphorus uptake by plants mm -hmm. in association with mutualism the relationship isn't is uh, there's a lot of dialogue that happens between the host and the bacterial fixing nodule or the mycorrhizae in the plant. And they're often full of negative feedbacks, which don't allow too much nitrogen to accumulate or too much phosphorus to accumulate. Yeah. The plant will shut it down. And so I'm sort of imagining that in your sort of vision of this at scale, one of the things that we've done in our industrial scale is we've eliminated those negative feedbacks. Yeah. So you talked about the upstream, but we have also eliminated the downstream. We allow excess nitrogen to get into our waterways, but plants and their microbes don't really allow for that excess mm -hmm. nitrogen fixation. So I'm wondering, as you're sort of envisioning a yeah. nitrogen fixi fixation system in a plant association, uh -huh. you also have to sort of take into account the host not just the soil and you have to you have to keep that negative feedback system in place so i'm just kind of curious if you could think about sort of the ways in which nature inspires you to think about sort of natural constraints and systems it's a great question i think like I think the reality now is like because it's not enough like you have to add fertilizer too. often people are actually talking about like removing negative feedback loops like right so so like part of the ways that you can approach the the technology it, again like at, at where it is today um 
is is by saying like i'm gonna i'm gonna just like delete the regulator like the negative loop because then i'll i'll be like constitutively making nitrogen for as long as i can until this bacteria dies um uh like and it's not it's not enough to like cause the downstream impact yet so like it's it's fine but i think you're you're sort of hinting at like it's it's not enough yet right like you yeah, like the again if you play out the tape if you imagine this world where it all works and we have we have the, you know the, that kind of design of those mutualisms would would have to be part of it and the question i guess like i don't know what it looks like right like you don't want to how much do you try to like control every bit of that like right or like how much of it is like understanding like you know tuning or like finding the right sort of balance between what already kind of is happening or not i, I don't know i don't know if i, <laughs> I don't have yeah. okay yeah my question was actually very similar to colin's yeah. and it's um solving a lot of these issues i always think about like two opposing um philosophies on how to do it and the one is like you guys do it like with technology you engineer things to make it more efficient mm -hmm. and the other one is with like conservation conservation ecology and biology use less and work with nature yeah um so i'm wondering if you guys uh think of a new solution for a given problem so like nitrogen fixation do you like model um when you scale it how um efficient will the benefits be that you get versus yeah. the cost so like if you scale something for um nitrogen fixation with the approaches you mentioned there's going to have to be a lot of um industrial build up around it whereas like if you use the um more conservation approach it'll be um less uh it, it'll have less of a carbon footprint essentially but it'll be less efficient so the yield will be lower is the, the conservation approach there is like just use less fertilizer no or less food what's what is the conservation approach it would be point? like farming in a way that's more um like regenerative ag in a way where you maybe you'll plant nitrogen crops with something else yeah, yeah. um like farming in an old school conservation way but not just use less of the product yeah um but there's oftentimes there'll be two different ways to get to the same solution um there's the technology way and there's the um the design with nature way without manipulating things uh -huh. when you at ginkgo have meetings and talk about these things yeah. do you like map out like what's the what could be the carbon yeah cost of all of this uh, yes. And I think maybe like our approach is sort of like, why not both? Like, I don't, I don't think that they have, like you're positioning them as opposites. I think that they're, they're part of the solution together. Right. So, um, we have a lot of really interesting like relationships and conver conversations with folks like in the conservation community, um, who are themselves like trying to figure out like, well, where are there opportunities for technologies to be part of the approaches that we take with conservation that like actually like thinking of them as opposites, like may in the long run, like not really like it, it doesn't, it's not as helpful. <laughs> um, like you, you, cause you, yeah, if, if you're kind of at odds, like one will win and, and I don't, I don't want conservation to lose. Right. Like, I think it, it's sort of a, why not both? And the, the approach, uh, the sort of like philosophy here, I can go like that kind of, why not both? Like, I know it sounds like wishy-washy, but I think it really is the right, the right approach, like ideologically. So again, like when I, this is more like the STS talk, like when you think about like binaries, like that we create these things, like either, or like either conservation, like, or technology, like either science, like, or emotion, like either whatever, or that, like almost always those are like, those are spurious they're like they're that's not actually what like the real world is like they're they're mixtures right it's not science or or society it's they're together like and and sort of like understanding them together and the like the complexity they're in is is more interesting so we call that the unstable equilibrium and that, that's like the that's our meme at ginkgo that helps us like sort of think about two things at the same time um so in in uh, physics you have like a, a ball on a hill um and so it can it can rest at the top of the hill but it's an unstable equilibrium right or a dynamic equilibrium more like a pencil on its tip 
uh, right? Like it could fall on to either side, like if you let it, um, but you can also like balance it there. And so it, that sort of, that we use that language to talk about, it's, it's hard to be in that balance. Like usually both sides are mad at you at the same time, <laughs> uh, or like, you know, you're, 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 you're have to work hard to like find that path to have two thoughts at once. Um, but that's how we approach it. So I, I would say, I, I don't see regenerative approaches to ag as, as opposite of this. I see them like as part of the toolkit that we need to like get to where we need to go. And so, uh, yeah, that that's my, that, and, and but yes, it, the answer is like, yes, we do have to, and we do like look at the sort of like modeling at long-term. So, I mean, I don't, I think ideally yeah, you're not building up a huge carbon intensive infrastructure to grow bacteria um, like in, 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 and put them on the, um, uh, on the tanks because those are things that can happen again, like at a much, much reduced um, uh, sort of temp uh, temperature pressure. Um, someone keeps calling me and I hope it's not my school, my daughter's school. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, but yeah, that's, I, I think, I think it would be much lower. So yeah, when you look at the LCAs and stuff, I can, I can show you all that stuff. Like it, it would be lower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe just some quick thoughts. Yeah. Uh, somebody's wondering about your thoughts on scaling up microbial dyes from bacteria. Um, I'm into it. I think it's very interesting. Um, the it's actually interesting, like to look at the history there. So there there were projects in like the 80s uh, where where it was like I think it was Genencore, one of these like genetic engineering companies was trying to make indigo um, in bacteria and sell it to Levi's and like where it landed again was like, ah, does it scale? Like it's too expensive. Like, because if you use oil to make indigo, it's like ridiculously cheap. Like these dyes are like stupidly cheap. Um, and so uh, one of my collaborators, longtime collaborator is Natsai Chieza. Uh, she runs a, a design studio called Faber Futures. And she's come, developed over these many years, this technology to like uh, dye fabric, like in situ. Like she kind of has these giant Petri dishes and she grows the bacteria on them and they deposit the dye directly on the fabric. and the those processes take like 500 times less water um, than, than the kind of traditional methods where you make dye at a big factory, you ship it somewhere else, you put it on the things, you rush the run, rinse them with water, um, you run all that water into the river. Um, so like it, it implies though a very, very different scale and a very, very different approach and a very, very different kind of like um, set of tools and techniques. And so I think that's very interesting. I also think like probably you can again, like you could start to, you know, the, the the indigo projects were 30 years ago, like we're better at genetic engineering now, we're better at some of the scale up, we could probably get more efficient, um, but probably even again at the theoretical maximum, it's going to be more expensive than the, the oil version. And so you have to start like, again, like imagining different kinds of like political landscape, <laughs> um, economic landscape, what, like Levi's like, no, no, really, I cannot use this dye. Um, so I have to use this one for whatever reason. Um, start to like reimagine the the whole supply chain. So yeah, new, new ways of approaching it. Check out Natsai's work. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, a kombucha maker and I'm just sort of imagining adding something to my kombucha to create a, I can have one batch that's blue, one batch that's yet orange, uh -huh. one batch, you know, and I'll start dyeing my own clothes in my kitchen. That could be really fun. <laughs> Uh huh. So people do this. So there's companies that are doing like bacterial cellulose, which is basically kombucha. Um, and yeah, like could yeah, if you if you sort of tune the genes of the bacteria that are making it, um, and it's like a bacteria and a yeast. Um, you can start to uh, imagine different kinds of colors. Ben and I, so Ben Wolf in the biology department is like old friend of mine, and uh, I have a strain of yeast um at Ginkgo that we developed that makes like grape flavor, grape soda flavor. Um, and so we actually like we made like a pretty decent kombucha like that had the the like his Ben Scoby and and my yeast as a sort of like a uh, third member that was making like a weird kind of grape soda flavor um the eventually the symbiosis broke apart we'd have to do a little bit more work to make that mutualism work better but you can do it like that yeah that's that's the artisanal GMO kombucha it's coming <laughs> yeah on that I want to thank you again for a wonderful talk very stimulating and thank you all for coming big hand <laughs>